Uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce uh, our colleague uh, and speaker, Dr. Ed Bramley from University of Warwick, UK. Ed is currently working as a reader, um, some, something like senior associate professor with a 50-50 appointment between the Department of Mathematics and WMG. He is the recipient of UKRA Future Leaders Fellowship Investigating Mathematical Modeling of Metal Forming. Today, Ed is going to uh, present his talk on mathematical modeling of fold rolling and beyond. Ed, thank you very much uh, for taking time and the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much and thank you very much to all of you for, for coming along. Um, um, so first of all, I want to convince you that there is a use for mathematical modeling in uh, metal forming. Uh, then I want to give you a relatively relatively understandable as far as maths derivations go of a model of cold rolling um, and later on we'll find out that actually it's wrong but uh, so if you're feeling particularly um, uh, sharp at the moment you might seem to see if you can spot the deliberate mistake there then we'll talk briefly about asymmetric rolling and then I'll talk finally about a better model of cold rolling uh, which is work in progress. Um, there are lots of people who are involved in this research. Um, I start, got interested in this by working with um, Professor Julian Allwood at the uh, University of Cambridge, and um, he is a collaborator on this project. Um, I've had previous um, PhD students and postdocs, Chris and Jeremy um, and uh, Hansen, uh, and I'm currently working with a um, uh, very fun team of researchers, uh, Dr. Deeran uh, O'Kiley at the uh, University of Limerick and her PhD student, Frank, and uh, Mojda, who's here at, um, uh, at Warwick. Um, and so a lot of this work is theirs, not mine. Uh, I should say all the mistakes are mine and all the clever ideas are theirs. Um, OK, so why is metal forming um, uh, uh, why is mathematical modeling important in metal forming? So it comes back to this idea of something called flexible metal forming. And by flexible, we don't mean bendable, we mean reconfigurable. So I would claim, and I'm, I'm very happy for people to um, uh, say that I'm wrong here, I would claim that today's metal forming processes are inflexible in that the metal forming machines attempt to repeat the same operation. That's, that's their aim, just do the same thing over and over again. And um, that this has a number of consequences, um, but one of them is that um, there's an awful environmental cost to um, metal manufacturing and metal forming. And uh, the statistic I just wanted to highlight here is that the equivalent of 100 coal power stations is wasted each year globally from manufacturing steel that is subsequently scrapped and doesn't end up in a product. So um, small gains here might have significant environmental impact. Uh, but it's not just the environmental impact. Uh, potentially, we would like to have smarter or more flexible metal forming, which is computer controlled metal forming that um, adapts in real time to ideally correct mistakes and give the right things coming off each time. So what might that do? Well, it might allow for more complicated parts to be made, potentially. It might allow for parts to be made with higher tolerances. It would certainly allow to handle more variable input material because you can't, if you have a more variable input material, you can't do the same thing each time and expect the same thing to come out. Um, and for example, that might enable more use of recycled material. Um, hopefully it would allow less waste because there's uh, less scrap. Um, it might also allow to make the, uh, uh, the, the machinery, the forming um, tools cheaper. Um, for example, a lot of tools I understand at the moment are extremely stiff and rigid and heavy because and expensive because um, you don't want them to wear, you don't want them to bend um, in order to get high accuracy parts. Whereas if you've got a computer control loop that looks at what's coming out and corrects for it, then maybe you can have a much more flimsy, cheaper machine producing the same quality parts because it corrects for any mistakes it makes. And perhaps even we could have one machine that makes more than one different type of part. Some sort of degree of customization might be possible. So in a minute, I'll come back to this. But the finite, finite element analysis is the go to tool for most engineers. That's my understanding. And while it has many advantages, um, it's just too slow for real time online control. 
Um, again, if you disagree with that, please do let me know. I'd be very happy to actually get into the, the, the details of this. So what I'm going to do is just give you a quick overview of a few of the flexible metal forming um, processes that I currently know of. And again, if you've got any more, please do let me know. Um, and then um, we'll have a look at um, how we might uh, how we might come up with a better way of modeling that isn't finite element analysis or not better, quicker. So. Oh, excuse me. So the first one I'm going to show you is incremental sheet forming. Um, incremental sheet forming has been around for quite a while now, um, and it's a, a flexible process in that you start with a flat sheet and a computer model of what you want, and then you have a computer controlled tool and off it goes and it produces something, whatever it was that you wanted. So for example, here's an example of a flat sheet being formed with an indenting tool and uh, forming a some sort of mask-like shape. And there's a video of this, not of this one, of a different thing. So here is the sheet. You can see it's clamped all the way around. Off goes the tool and it starts forming whatever it's forming. And the first thing you can see is that there's a huge amount of flexing of this sheet as it goes around. There's an awful lot of elasticity. And after a while, it gets to some sort of shape Batman gets his nunchuck and off we go. We get to the, the, the we start making something different. Of course, this is not the part that was wanted. Probably this bit in the middle is what was wanted. And so what you do is, first of all, you unclamp it and then you cut out the bit you want. And because of this huge amount of built up residual stress, it's quite likely that what you eventually get out isn't the shape that's currently there. So there's, a, again, another big optimization problem on top of this to say, if I want a particular shape out afterwards, when I've unclamped it, when I've cut it out, what shape should I actually form here? And, and this sort of um, residual stress is one of the problems with um, incremental sheet forming, or, or so I'm told. OK, um, there's uh, roll forming which makes very long um, uh, uh, prismatic type shapes. And um, my understanding is that classic roll forming uh, is done by starting off putting some rollers in the right places to get roughly the right thing, tweaking them until they're getting exactly the right thing, cutting off the bit that was wasted, and then um, off you go and you can produce as much as you like of this, this long product. Um, but what about if you want some variation along the length of your product? For example, you want some sort of customized tapered eye beam or you want here. There's some I don't quite know what this part is, but it, so, something that's clearly got some sort of axial variation to it. And the problem here is that um, you don't have the luxury of running it until you get it right and then cutting off what didn't work. You've got to get it right first time because it's going to be part of it, it. It's varying as it goes along. So again, how can you design a control path for some sort of flexible machine like that. Um, here is an example of um, an alleged ex attempted example of flexible um, ring rolling. So um, classic ring rolling allows you to roll a rectangular cross-sectioned ring. Oh, and here um, the uh, the aim is to get a non-cross uh, a rectangular cross-section. Um, it's not really flexible because they've had to machine these rollers here in order to have this um, uh, in this particular shape they wanted. And even in this case, um, they've hit some sort of instability and you can see the entire ring has bent out of the plane. Uh, I wouldn't like to be <laughs> where this guy is at the moment there. Um, having said all of that, um, they then did do another attempt at this, got a ring with a non-rectangular uh, non uh, cross-section, published a paper and claimed success. So I'm not quite sure whether you would call this success or not, but certainly you couldn't turn up with a USB stick with the model of the cross-section you wanted, plug it into this machine and get it to come out. This is probably um, the closest I've come to, uh, well, it is the closest I've come to an actual flexible uh, spinning machine. This is in the uh, Julian Orwood's um, lab in Cambridge, uh, and this is a flexible spinning machine. So traditionally, spinning takes a flat sheet, here's the workpiece there, um, and clamps it, spins it round, and then you have a wooden mandrel that goes on the inside of a particular shape you'd like, and you use a working roller to push the um, uh, your workpiece onto your wooden mandrel. Um, 
they claimed that at any point during this process, the wooden mandrel is only in contact with the workpiece at, at most three places. They vary during the process, but most there are three points of contact, they claim. And so they built this machine with no wooden mandrel, but with three points of contact support rollers. And the idea was that they could then use this to make any shape. Um, and it worked um, up to a point. Um, the first PhD student designed and made the machine and did a very good job of it. That's Omar Music. And the second PhD student did an extremely good job of trying to optimise control paths for it and basically came to the conclusion that it was done by trial and error and by hand and that there were, he hadn't come up with a better way. Uh, and so um, James Ponyblank's um, PhD thesis had a number of different ways of trying to control this. And there are a number of problems. Uh, the first is you, you normally don't go straight to the desired shape in the first pass. You go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards, slowly working it to the thing you wanted. How aggressive are you in that and how um, uh, depends on determines uh, how good a quality the, the final part is. And if you're overly aggressive, you get wrinkling. And if you're under, under aggressive, uh, then you don't get to the final shape. And so here's a computer simulation of wrinkling. So we've got a roller here pushing on a sheet that's going round. And what you can see is as it gets to the edge, wrinkles start forming and they self reinforce and eventually the process has to be stopped. So. One of the things that mathematical modeling could do that I'm not going to talk about here is some sort of stability analysis to say, why do the wrinkles form and what could we do about it? Uh, indeed, can we predict whether it will be wrinkle or not and then we can just say just stay away from that parameter space and hopefully everything will converge nicely um so and here finally is one that we were actually aiming for so this is an idea from professor julian orwood um it's not a valid industrial metal forming process it's a demonstrator machine and the idea with this demonstrator is that it would take this um what would you call this not strip ribbon maybe um very thin uh, narrow um uh um uh, workpiece and it would go between two computer controlled rollers so it would get come out thinner uh, you could potentially drive the rollers at different speeds and you can use these guide rollers to change the entrance and exit boundary conditions and perhaps try to roll a um, something with a particular shape. Maybe you could try and roll a perfect circle where one half is one thickness and the other half is another thickness, something like that. The idea was that this would be a, a demonstrator to demonstrate online real time control. So you'd have some sort of laser scanning sheet scanning it here. and The process would then be con computer controlled and update itself to try and get the right shape. And in terms of actuators, this is not new technology. We can quite easily build something like this. In terms of sensors, it's not very new. You can quite easily have a, a laser uh, sheet uh, scanning it and, um, and various other sensors. Um, in terms of control loops, it's not very difficult. You've got a target you want to get to. The main problem with this is the modeling. And that's what this rest of this talk is going to be about. Could we come up with a quick to compute model that can be used in an optimizer in an online control loop to control this process? Um, so this is basically what I've said. The actuators exist. The sensors exist. In fact, most industrial metal forming um, uh, machinery tooling has these in it already. It's doing some form of online of, of control. It's just not this um, closed loop online control that I'm talking about here. Um, that most of them already have computers connected to them, they have controllers, that's all there. What's missing is this rapid model that says we're currently in this situation, we want to get to there, what's the best thing I can do next? So I'm claiming that this is the bit that's missing, but actually there are a number of other people who are also claiming this. So uh, James Ployblank, who was uh, in working, doing his PhD on the uh, spinning machine I showed you earlier, said in his um, uh, thesis, it would take over a year to fully design a single tool path for a single product and a single material using finer elements. There's clearly a need for a detailed model, but one that's faster than FE um, in order to do successful online automatic tool path generation. Um, in a review article, a number of authors said um, models uh, that will allow a designer to achieve greater accuracy are needed. And then in a set, another review article um, uh, 13 years later uh, about flexibility and metal forming, they said how to modify the toolpath 
based on measured error efficiently is still an unsolved problem, which depends on an accurate process model regarding the underlying mechanics. So basically, the message so far from this talk, I would claim, is that there is a need for quick to compute sufficiently accurate modeling, and that I don't think finer elements fills that hole. And so that's what I'm going to, that's what the aim of my um, fellowship is, to try and come up with way, mathematical tools and indeed ma actual uh, models uh, for particular processes to demonstrate how applied maths could help here. Before I go on to anything else, are there any questions so far? No, looks OK. Yeah. Brilliant. OK, I shall assume silence means understanding. Not always a tricky assumption, but I, I shall yeah. assume that. OK, so um, let me tell you about the modelling we're doing. So we started off, well, we, by we, it was it, with me and um, Chris Cothorn and Jeremy Linton um, uh, in, back in 2013, I think, so almost ten, yeah, so 10 years ago, we started off on a small project, seeing what we could do. And we tried to pick the simplest possible thing we could do just to cut our teeth on it. And we're still working on that today. And that simplest possible model is a model of cold rolling. Um, in fact, it's an even, it's an as simple a model of cold rolling as you can possibly get. So um, the model is of um, uh, a strip that comes in from the left here, goes between two large rollers and comes out thinner. And the thickness starts off being 2 H naught and it's reduced on either side by a thickness delta H. And that occurs over a length L that it's in contact with the rollers. Um, and typically, uh, various people have made various approximations to try and um, uh, uh, get some sort of solution out for this problem. And the one that I understand is still in, in use by industry today is one by Orowan from 1943, which is unfortunately a little bit ad hoc, at least by today's applied math standards, isn't easily generalized to other situations. So what we tried to do is we tried to bring a technique called asymptotics to this problem. And in asymptotics, we make use of the fact that some parameters are small. And in this case, we're going to assume that the strip is thin compared with the length of the roll gap. So in some sense, this is a large rollers thin strip approximation. And we code that mathematically by saying this height H naught, the half height of the, of the strip, um, divided by L, the length of the roll gap, so this is the aspect ratio, is much less than one. And it turns out in what happens later, we'll also assume that the friction coefficient on the rollers is also much less than one. And that's because typically when we're thinking of a number much less than one, in this context, we're thinking of about 0.3 or 0.1 or something like that. So not infinitesimally small, just smaller than one. OK, so I'm going to explain how we do the mathematical modelling on this problem. So there's going to be some maths on these few, next few slides. Um, Hopefully that should be familiar to some of you. Um, if not, don't worry, I'll talk you through what they mean and hopefully that should give you enough information to know, roughly speaking, what's going on. So we're going to make the simplest possible approximations we can do. We're going to do the simplest, simplest possible thing we can do. And that means we're going to assume an extremely simple and oversimplified um, material model. So we're going to assume that this material is rigid, perfectly plastic. So we're going to ignore elasticity, we're going to ignore anisotropy, we're going to ignore strain hardening and strain rate hardening. We're just going to have an extremely simple material model here. Now, the first thing that lots of people say to me is that's far too simple for, for practice. And I'm not really in a position to disagree with that, but if I can't solve this simple problem, I've got no hope of solving the real problem. And actually, when we solved the simple problem, it actually was a really quite good approximation to the real problem. So actually, it turns out that this isn't as big a problem as you might think. We're also going to assume that the rollers are rigid, so we're going to have no roll flattening. Um, we're going to assume it's plain strain, so we're not anywhere near the edges. This is effectively a 2D problem. As I say, the simplest possible thing. When we do that, we get this set of governing equations. So let me talk you through what each of these things are. Um, the material is moving flat through the roll gap at a velocity V, where U is the horizontal part of that velocity and V is the vertical part of that velocity. 
and it's being driven through by some stress given by the stress set tensor sigma and sigma consists of a pressure term and a deviatoric term and this deviatoric term this sij this traceless part is the bit that's involved in plasticity so the governing equations we want to work with are a force balance. We're going to ignore inertia, again, because it's the simplest possible problem, and also because inertia doesn't seem to be important in these sort of problems. So we've got this equation here says horizontal forces balance. And this equation here says vertical forces balance. Then we've got the next three equations here are the flow rule that says effectively that the stress is in the same direction as the pl plastic stress is in the same direction as the plastic strain. We've got incompressibility, and then we've got the yield condition, which is this is von Mises yield condition, where kappa is the uh, is the yield stress in shear. Hopefully that seems familiar to some people, uh, but don't worry if it isn't. Uh, these are uh, form some partial differential equations to solve inside the roll gap, and then we've got boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions are that there's no flow through the surface. And we're talking about the surface here as being H. So H is the H naught was the entrance height of the uh, thickness of the sheet. And H is now the thickness of the sheet as it goes through. So it's in contact with the rollers. So H gives us the shape of the rollers. And <clears throat> this says that there's no flow through the surface. All flow is along the surface of the rollers at, um, at the roller. And then we've got Coulomb friction, which says that the tangential force is equal to mu times the normal force. And there's a plus or minus in here because initially friction acts to pull the material into the roll gap. And then you get to the neutral point after which friction acts to oppose it and pushes it back in. So that's why these arrows here are set showing that the friction is pulling it into the roll gap and then opposing it on the way out. And those are the governing equations. So if you were to solve this with finite elements, you might have some slightly more complicated equations because maybe you've got elasticity, maybe you've got strain rate, strain hardening, anisotropy, all those sort of things. But if you were to solve this using finite elements with the assumptions that we've made so far, these are the set of equations you would be solving using finite elements. And they're still too complicated for us to solve mathematically. So the first thing we do, and this is the first sign that I'm an applied mathematician, is that we non-dimensionalize everything. So if you haven't come across non-dimensionalization before, rather than measuring distance in meters or inches or millimeters and forces in newtons or pounds or anything like that, and rather than measuring um, uh, densities in kilograms per cubic meter or however you want to measure it, we're going to measure everything in terms of things that are innately part of the problem. So, for example, we are going to measure distance, horizontal distance X. By, so x hat is dimensional, x hat is, is in metres, and it's equal to l hat, which is in metres, that's the length of the roll gap, times some non-dimensional number x. So x equals zero corresponds to the entrance, and x equals one corresponds to the exit, and x equals half corresponds to halfway through the roll gap. <coughs> and that's true no matter how long the roll gap is. x here is my non-dimensional coordinate, and x hat is my dimensional coordinate. And you could say, why do that? <coughs> and the answer is because it gets rid of all the stuff that depends on dimensions and the parameters that you're left with at the end are the ones that are inherent to the problem that can actually change the type of behavior. So let me show you how that works. X we measure with respect to L, the length of the roll gap, but Y we measure with respect to H naught, the, the initial thickness of the strip. And H naught over L is delta, which is small. It's the aspect ratio. <coughs> <coughs> Similarly, we measure horizontal stress and vertical stress um, in terms of multiples of the yield stress, because that's the only stress we've got available in the problem. And we measure shear stresses in terms of the friction coefficient times the yield stress, because that's the relevant scale for the shear that's going on, because it's all friction driven. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. And we measure velocities in terms of the speed at which the rollers are going round, because that's our only velocity in the problem. Once I do all of that, I take all these things with hats on, I substitute all of that in, and I get the same set of equations, but without any hats on. 
And now there are no free parameters in the problem here. It doesn't matter what the length of the roll gap is or the thickness is. All of the free parameters are the ones that are written into these equations. So what are they? We've got this mu, which is the friction coefficient, and we've got this delta, which is the aspect ratio. And it doesn't matter what the yield stress is, and it doesn't matter what the size of the rollers is, and it doesn't matter what's... Those are the things that are going to affect what, what goes on. Um, so that's one consequence of all of this. And the second consequence is that all in these equations, which we couldn't solve before, now we've non-dimensionalized them. Some of these terms I've colored in red, they've got a delta squared in front of them. And delta is small. That's the new assumption we're making, that the roll gap is long and thin. And because delta is small, these terms ought to be much smaller than these other terms. And that's the handle that we can get on it in order to get a solution where we couldn't get one before. So we take all of these small red terms and we take them all to the right hand side. So again, I, all I've done so far is just rearrange the governing equations. And now we solve these equations as if the red terms weren't there. And that gives us our leading order solution. And we cross our fingers and we hope that that is simple enough to be able to solve and indeed it turns out it is so actually if you look at these equations without all the red terms here's an equation sxx squared is one that means that sxx is either plus one or minus one and we know which of those it is because of the way that the reformation is happening uh, at the boundaries that means that sxx is either is, is just plus, it's one so its y derivative is zero so this then equation here says that dp by dy is zero, so p is constant in terms of y, only varies with x, and so on and so forth. You substitute this into all the different equations, and eventually you find that you've only got one equation to solve, this one here, which is uh, an equation for the pressure as it goes through the roll gap. And everything else can be written in terms of that pressure. And you'll see all of these variables have got zeros on top of them, and that's because they're the, the first approximation, the zeroth order approximation. They're the approximation that has zero deltas in them. OK, I'll show you what that solution looks like in a minute. But let me just say that actually, because this is asymptotics, we can now turn the handle and get progressively more and more accurate solutions. It's not that we've actually assumed all of these red terms are zero. We've just got the solution that, they that we would get if they were zero. And now we can go back in and correct for it. So we can go back in and correct for it and get the next order um, correction. And you can solve all of that and you can get some answers out. Now, I'm not going to go through these details because they're a bit messy. And also because, as I said, there's a mistake in here and I'll, I'll leave it to you to spot the deliberate mistake. But the, um, the point is that there's a procedure you can go through to keep going and get more and more progressively, more and more accurate solutions. OK, so what we've what have we achieved? We've ended up getting a less accurate solution than we would have got for finite elements, but we've been able to write it down explicitly. There it is. Or I mean, it's an ODE, so I solved that ODE, but that, you know, I can do that in under a second in that lab, um, whereas running the finite elements takes much significantly longer. Um, and here's a comparison of a particular problem um, with, of the, uh, the, the maths, the, the analytic solution, which is the lines, and a finite element solution done in abacus, which is the um, the points. And what we're plotting here is the um, the shear stress, um, the axial stress, and the vertical stress as we uh, at the surface as we go through the um, the roll gap from the entrance, the exit. And what I would draw your attention to is that there's a pretty good agreement here. There's a bit of a disagreement at the beginning. That's because we assumed that everything was rigid and perfectly plastic. And so it starts plastically forming right at the very beginning, whereas the numerical solution is a, a sensible material model that's got elasticity in. And actually, the elasticity builds up until you get plastic deformation. So there is an entrance region here where we don't get the right answer because of the, the simplifications we've made. But actually, it looks like it doesn't change things. And the second thing is that here, there's a bit of a discrepancy. and this is the uh, tangential shear stress, the tangential force effectively at the surface. And 
our model had Coulomb friction, so we would expect a sudden switch from slipping in one direction to slipping in the other direction, and the numerics smooths that out. And we think that actually this is a problem with the numerics, that the numerics is overly smooth there, and that um, we're, uh, the, the maths is doing what, the mathematical solution is doing what it should do. There's, there's some debate about that, but that's my interpretation. Okay, I mean, this has solved a problem that was solved almost 100 years ago. Um, let's do something a bit more fun. Um, this is asymmetric rolling, where the top roller and the bottom roller are not exactly the same. Maybe one's bigger than the other. Maybe one's going around faster than the other. Maybe one's got a different rough surface roughness and therefore a different friction coefficient than the other. Um, but either way, um, we can do exactly the same thing as I've just shown you, but in a slightly more complicated um, math, set of maths, and we can get some solutions out. So now this is a, a comparison of um, uh, asymmetric rolling. So let me explain what we're looking at here. On the top, we're looking at the roll force that's needed. And on the bottom, we're looking at the roll torque that's needed in order to, to produce this material. Um, and on the horizontal axis, we've got some different versions of asymmetry. <laughs> so in the middle here, for example, this is the velocity of the top roller divided by the velocity of the bottom roller. So if it's one, it's symmetric. If it's less than one, one the top's going slower than the bottom. If it's greater than one, the top's going faster than the bottom. Similarly, here we've got asymmetry in roll, roll radius, and here we've got asymmetry in friction coefficient. Each one of these dots is a finite element simulation that's worked we've solved it for those parameters and we've worked out what's the role force and what's the role torque needed and the lines are what you get from the uh from the uh, asymptotics that we've done here so i th would say this is pretty good agreement between the theory and the numerics even and the the numerics is depending on how heavily optimized the numerics is and how heavily optimized your MATLAB code is for calculating the analytical solution, somewhere between 15 times faster and 1,000 times faster is, is the speed up we get from the analytic solution compared with the numerics. So this is my attempt at saying that there's probably something in this applied mathematical modeling. You could actually use this in uh, the, math, the maths here inside an optimization loop, which you couldn't do for the uh, finite elements. However, there's something else that happens with asymmetric rolling, and bizarrely, this is still unknown. So I'm going to show you something that I talk about here. I'm going to talk about asymmetric rolling, and this is something that is is just is is currently unknown. No one can no one knows this. Um, if you have asymmetric rolling, maybe the top roll is going around slower than the bottom roll, for example then what you would expect is not only would your workpiece get thinner as it goes between the rolls, it would probably pick up some curvature. Can we predict the curvature? I mean, that's probably quite necessary if we're going to build that demonstrator machine to be able to predict the curvature we get by, from, from some sort of asymmetry. And we had a go at doing this with our modeling, and we came to the conclusion that no, we couldn't predict the curvature. And then my PhD student, Jeremy Minton, in his last three months of PhD, did an amazing job doing a massive literature review of anyone who ever said they thought they could predict curvature from rolling. And here are some of the results that he found. If you are looking at asymmetric speeds, then there's a paper that says that there's a tendency to bend uh, downwards if the... Uh, small speed ratio, so that's the top one's going slower than the bottom one, and upwards with a higher speed ratio. So basically they're saying here it bends towards the roller that's going fastest. And there's another paper here which says exactly the opposite, that it bends towards the roller that's going slowest. And then there was a paper that said actually which way it bends depends on some of the other parameters, the thickness and the roll radio, ra uh, radius and the reduction ratio and all those sort of things. Hmm. Similarly, two papers in the same year disagreed about which way it bends if you've got different friction coefficients. This one says curvature is towards the lower friction surface, and this one says curvature is towards the higher friction surface. So, here are all the papers that Jeremy found. I forget what the legend is here, but there are three different sorts of symbols, circles, 
upward pointing triangles and downward pointing triangles. And those correspond in some order to experimental studies, numerical studies and theoretical studies. And here we have some graphs on the vertical axis for all of these is curvature signed so that a positive curvature means bending up and a negative curvature means bending down. And on the bottom, we've got different sorts of asymmetry, roll radius asymmetry, friction asymmetry, speed asymmetry and so on. And all of these points have been put on these graphs and there is absolutely no trend here. So not only can we not predict the curvature, it would appear that no one else can predict the curvature either. In fact, it's tantalizingly difficult. Here is one particular study. I think this was a numerical study. They're looking at curvature, which is signed again. So positive means bending upwards, negative means bending downwards. And they're looking at a roll radius ratio. So this is the top roll being the same size as the bottom roll, and then the top roll getting smaller than the bottom roll. Now, have a look at the, each of these different colours is a different parameter, but have a look at the green ones. When we start with the top and the bottom roll being the same size, we get no curvature. That's what we'd expect. It's symmetric. When we start making the top roll smaller, the sheet starts bending upwards towards the top roll. But as we make the top roll smaller and smaller, it actually doesn't bend as much. And then it comes out flat again. And then if we make the top roll even smaller, it starts bending down. So actually, even for a fixed set of parameters, whether it bends up or down depends on not just the asymmetry, but how much asymmetry there is. And all of the models up until now, it says people have tried to do slab theory models and various sort of things to predict this. <coughs> no one got this nonlinear effect. All of them predict if it's going to start bending up, it will keep bending up. <coughs> so that's one of the one of the unknowns. And we think we, we certainly haven't solved this problem, but we think we might be on the way to solving this at the moment. So let me show you something else that we found. And I think these two things might be related. So in this plot, I'm plotting a lot of different. Uh, so, um, so we're, we're again, we're looking side on at our strip. It comes in from the left, goes between a top white roller and a bottom white roller and comes out thinner. And the colours here correspond to the shear stress. And the, all the pictures on the left come from finite elements. And the scale here is a bit confusing. So in this picture, we go for this. This axis here is 200 long and this axis here is 100 long. And then in this bottom picture, although it looks the same, this axis here is still 200 long, but this is 2,500 long. So this is a very long, very thin roll gap, and this is a quite short, fat roll gap. And that's what this delta means. This delta is the ratio, and you can see as we progressively get delta gets smaller, the, the, the horizontal axis gets longer. And on the right, we've got the prediction from the maths. And if you sort of blur your eyes a bit, you can sort of convince yourself that this looks a bit like this. But it shouldn't do because we derived our asymptotics in the limit that delta tends to zero and delta equals one is certainly not small. Um, let's have a look at the small one. If you blur your eyes a bit, you can sort of convince yourself that this picture looks a bit like this one, apart from all the wiggles. And when we showed this to some engineers, who had some experience of finite element analysis, they said, oh, your, your finite elements hasn't converged. You shouldn't be getting all these wiggles. But actually, if you look at an intermediate case, these wiggles resolve themselves and they're actually there. There's actually this interesting uh, pattern of um, uh, positive and negative shear as you go through. And that is not captured at all in the mathematical model we have at the moment. And so that's one of the things I said there was a deliberate mistake in there. And this is one of the consequences of it. We at the moment at, in that previous model I showed you, we haven't captured that. So. Why do I think this is interesting? Well, there's three reasons I think it's interesting. First of all, because we were comparing our analytic solution to the numerics, we discovered this interesting pattern. And most people, I've, in fact, everyone I've talked to didn't know that there was this pattern there. Whether it's important or not, I don't know. But we found something that we weren't looking for that I don't think anyone else had seen, or at least no one, no one's talked to me about having seen this interesting pattern. 
Um, secondly, um, with some, some much more recent numerical results, which I'll show you in a minute, um, we think that this pattern might have an awful lot to do with the residual stress that's left in the material after rolling. And so actually this pattern may well matter. And thirdly, imagine this is all with symmetric rolling. Imagine if I did something asymmetric, what I suspect would happen, and I haven't done this, so I don't know, but what I suspect will happen is that the top pattern will shift compared with the bottom one, and you'll end up with some curvature as it comes out. And as you make more and more asymmetry, the top pattern will shift more and more and more until they're completely out of phase. And that'll give you the maximum amount of curvature. And then if you make even more asymmetry, they'll shift even more. And eventually they'll come back to being in phase again and you'll go back to having zero curvature. So I suspect that this pattern might be the key to this sort of interesting nonlinear behavior to the curvature we saw before that we're trying to predict. Anyway, whatever it is, we would now like to update our model to improve our model to actually capture this effect. So why should you get this interesting pattern here? Well, if you look at an old, the sort of older fashioned method of slip lines, you find that this pattern corresponds to the slip line pattern. So here is a numerical simulation on the top. Uh, this is courtesy of uh, Frank at um, uh, the University of Limerick. Um, so this simulation, the material comes in from the left, it gets reduced and goes out thinner to the right. Here's the roller in white at the top here. And this is including elasticity and, and for a realistic material parameters. And what you can see is you get this interesting pattern like we saw before here. And if you post process this and you plot on the slip line field, then what you find is that the slip lines do indeed exactly follow this up, down, up, down um, pattern. So I'm not going to go into slip lines now. Um, I want to uh, rush through this last bit to um, uh, allow some time for questions. Um, but basically, we think there's some reason why we're getting this. And if you look here, this is after the roll gap, the rollers leave here. After the roll gap, we get this interesting confluence of all these things here and this effect here, which as you can see here. This is, um, uh, in fact, you can see it better on this. This top plot here is a von Mises stress. Um, you can see it's at yield where it's dark red. And then what you can see after it's been rolled, there's a quite significant amount of residual stress sitting here at an interesting layer somewhere under the surface, but not at the center. And this is about two thirds of the yield stress. So it's a quite significant residual stress that's lying there. And it just happens to be where the slip lines converge to at the exit. So we think, again, this pattern here has got something to do with the residual stress that's in the material. Right. So I'm going to skip, um, skip through this very quickly because um, it's more difficult maths than you saw before. I don't understand it so well and it's not finished yet. But this is what uh, Mojda is currently working on uh, in her PhD at Warwick. And we are trying to correct this. And there's a number of different equations, similar sorts of things, but actually different asymptotic regime. And eventually you end up with something that's significantly more complicated, but that looks a bit like, well, this is the picture we had before and this is the new model from Mojda. And what you can see is that there's a much better agreement between the pictures on the right and the numerics on the left. In particular, we're matching the right number of these oscillations. We're matching the right areas where it changes color. Um, we're, um, uh, we think we're, we're getting the right sort of results out here. Not perfect. There's some problem at the entrance at the moment. Um, but um, uh, this is, as I say, this is work in progress. OK, so given that that's work in progress, um, where are we going with this now? Well, um, hopefully I've given you at least some ideas that there's potential for maths to give a, um, a better quick to compute result. Um, it's certainly a tool that is complementary to finite elements. This mathematical modeling works very well when there are two things of very different sizes. Finite elements works very well when all things are about the same order of magnitude. Um, where are we going to go with it? Well, we want to complete this analysis that I showed you. Um, we want to start including some more realistic damage modelings, models. That's what Mojda's PhD is, is, is eventually going to be about. So things like hardening, anisotro anisotropy and damage. Um, clearly, elasticity is also important. And there's other people, including uh, Deeran and um, uh, Frank, who are working on um, putting elasticity into this problem. And then there are various other more general problems. So in terms of uh, um, strip rolling, um, Tata Steel are interested in um, reducing the amount of waviness at the edges of the strip. Um, 
can we make a demonstrator model that can do asymmetric rolling? Can we generalize some of the techniques we've learned here to other processes such as V-bending or ring rolling or um, roll forming or the English wheel or spinning? And can we actually try and uh, um, have a go at building a demonstrator and then actually doing some online control of some some real world and that, that's quite a way off yet actually do have some industrial impact from this is probably quite a way off so anyway i would just like to thank my um collaborators again and i'm very happy to take some questions thank you very much thank you thank you thank you for the wonderful talk and uh, um i welcome any questions uh, from the audience i, I, I call I, yeah i call yeah please yeah Hi. That was excellent. I I, I, re I really enjoyed that. I think I'm I'm not going to lie. It's going to take some time just to digest it and, <laughs> and, and to, to 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 get to the point. So I, I, I certainly that pattern is something that's that that's crept up in some of the modelling that we've been kind of looking at in the past, and we've assumed that it was wrong. Ah, <laughs> oh, so, fantastic. Okay. So, so that's that's interesting itself. It. Wondering whether there's anything that we can do experimentally to help verify this on 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 our side of things, yeah. and to then think about what's the real magnitude of this, say, in hot processing, with with with, with you know how how much should we be worried about this? I guess is 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 the is the, the and and for that I guess we've got to be able to verify whether the, the magnitude of, of of these kind of patterns is is, exactly. is, is right exactly. so yeah so i mean um the, the first thing i should say is that one of the advantages of doing the simplest possible thing which is what we've done here and throwing everything out of the window is that this should if if we get it here we should probably get it everywhere Right. I mean, I've, I've said this is cold rolling, but actually, where have I assumed that it's cold? Right. You know, this is so basic that it's a bad approximation of everything. Right. right. Sure. So um, so my, my guess is that it, it would be there in, in hot rolling. Whether it matters as much, I don't know. I mean, we're the the problem is that this pattern here is the shear stresses during the rolling process. If you were to stop and move the rollers away, this pattern would disappear because there's no force there anymore. So yeah. experimentally, it would be extremely difficult to see this pattern. So I think we have to be quite a bit cleverer with how we would do the experiment. I think we would want to look at what the implications of this pattern being there or not being there are, and then find out which of those can we actually test for experimentally and have a go at doing that. And one of the things that comes out of this is that, well, we haven't got all the way there, is that it, I think it's likely that this pattern has got something to do with the position of the residual stress in the in the output. Because if you're um, hot rolling, actually that's going to relax quite quickly. Mm. So it may be that the 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 way to look at this is to look at it in, in cold rolling first. But but I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about metal forming and metallurgy and things to really know what to do experimentally about this or whether it's important. It, it, we just we found it and we were worried about it because we we thought we'd got something wrong. And then it looks like actually we might we might have found something that other people thought was wrong, but turns out is there. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I, whether, you know, these things can um, butterfly effect uh, kind of like just you know, or, you know, and just snowball out of control. Whether this is the beginnings of kind of cobbling and things like that, that um, mm -hmm. you know, it's got to start off with start somewhere. And mm. yeah, I, 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 it is, it, it's interesting, and it's just thinking about what the what the, exactly what the are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and, and what we can do, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Speak, uh, as an experimentalist to, ha to help figure out whether uh, how, how we can yeah um, I, I, sh I should have said i mean so sumit has been doing uh, sumit is co-supervising mojda sorry sumit i didn't get your photo on the right. um, he, 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 he's just Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, i've also been chatting with sumit a little bit about um uh you know, his first question was well, how do we find this experimentally and so on maybe we should get a few of us together and just do some brainstorming get get a um uh get a room with some coffee and some whiteboards and have a go at seeing if we can work out um, what we might, where we might, wh which direction we might want to go with the mod modeling so that we could get some prediction out that, that could then be verified experimentally maybe. Yeah. So, so, so if it's... Um, uh, I, I think Thomas uh, raised oh, his hand. Yeah. Um, let's go with him. Uh, please, Thomas. Yeah. It's fine, I'm enjoying the discussion. So if you guys oh, want okay. to keep talking. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yep. 
uh, you please uh, proceed with your question. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah. Okay. My my question was going to be to add. Um, so, what did Orwan actually assume in this 1943 paper um, that, that, so, that is then used in? <coughs> yeah. So, um, uh, I. I have an extremely bad recollection of what's in that paper. I think Mojda, Mojda will correct me because she's here um, uh, about any mistakes I make in this. But my understanding, my very basic understanding, was they said that basically um, this situation here looks a bit like a wedge. And so they solved it to a wedge. Now, a wedge was better than what people were doing before, which is they said it looks rectangular, so they sold it for rectangle. And the wedge is a better approximation. But it's, first of all, it's not a sim it's not a, you can't turn the handle and get progressively better and better approximations out of that. It's just one approximation you make. Uh, and secondly, it doesn't generalize very well to any other sorts of metal forming processes. So um, I've tried to ignore that because what I wanted to do was start with the governing equations and work out what to do from those. And that's, I think, the sort of more modern, more fluid dynamics -y type of way, uh, way of doing it. But yeah, um, Mojda has revisited it and said, actually, there's, there's also interesting things that we could learn from Orwan's paper, and I, we should probably go back to it again. It's a very good point. No, 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 I wasn't. I was just in, intrigued to see what the, what the assumptions that were originally made in this thing were. But yeah, thanks very much. Mojda, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, apparently not. OK, um, sure. Okay, uh, Sumit, would you like to add anything? Um, perhaps uh, just a quick one. So um, this whole idea about uh, multi-scale modeling um, exists quite a bit, actually. So uh, one of the other problems that's quite common is uh, fracture. So where um, fracture occurs on a very local level, but then has a global impact on, on something. Um, is it? Can asymptotics be used for to describe uh, fracture events as well? So um, the <coughs> uh, yes, potentially, but it's an extremely difficult problem. Um, I mean, uh, Tom, as Tom knows as well, the um, uh, the the holy grail would be to start off with an atomistic description of the material and work up from there to a nice continuum law we could apply with everything else in between, and. Um, that is a uh, technically a homogenization type problem, which is a multiple scales type problem. Um, and it is so difficult that, you know, there are so many people working on, on that and, and, you know, making progress, but not really getting anywhere. Um, so, um, yes, it would be lovely to do that. Um, but my understanding is that there's sort of at least four different intermediate scale, well, four different scales, atomistic, um, uh, um, dislocation based continuum, um, grain, uh, whole grains, and then actual continuum. And, um, uh, you know, people, I don't think any of those boundaries have actually been joined sensibly vigorously. Um, when I say multiple scales here, um, it's actually being used in, in that context. It's sort of a homogenization like context, but effectively, um, the, the the homogenization here is over each of these oscillations. So basically what it says is that these oscillations here look like they're dominating, whereas here they look like oscillations over a background. This is the background, and then we need a new, that varies over the entire length of the roll gap, okay. and then we need a new scale to get the oscillation. So that's what the multiple scales is in, in this sense. Okay. Right. Um, but yes, similar approaches do work elsewhere, but I'm not going to try them because there are many people who are significantly better than I am who have made much, very little progress. Right. Thanks. Uh, but I should also plug here, um, we have got um, a doctoral training centre in Warwick called HETSIS, and we have got a um, research um, uh, centre called the Warwick Centre for Predictive Modelling, and they do a huge amount of this sort of stuff. And okay. I really think that there, are, there should be some really nice synergies between WCPM and um, WMG and the Steels Group. Um, so um, uh, that, that would be a good place to look for those sort of things, I would say. OK, thanks. We would love to talk to you. <laughs> more yes. about this stuff. Um, so there, there are people in, in HEDSYS who, so uh, for example, um, James Commode has worked extensively on fracture in silicon at the atomistic scale, um, uh, like trying to span as many scales as possible. Uh, it's always the goal, but uh, yeah, it would be nice to talk to people that work at this more continuum scale and try to link up as well as we can, because, you know, 
lots of atomistic level people talk to each other, but then it's always, you know, we would like to pass this information somehow into a continuum modeling in a useful way. Um, okay. And also vice versa, take stuff, take take the stress state that is relevant at these atomistic scales and apply it and things like this. So yeah, I would love to meet you all at some point and have a chat. Um, um, because I, I gen generally work on kind of uh, microstructural level uh, modeling. Okay. Um, but yeah. In fact, can I can I just plug here um, that um, as part of my uh, UKRI Future Leaders Fellowship, I'm going to be organising a mini conference, which is going to be taking place, I suspect, the week after term finishes um, here in Warwick. And um, uh, we're going to have some big names coming in from elsewhere, um, but um, it's going to be you know, anyone who wants to come along is very welcome to come along. And I, it's going to be a three day, well, probably two and a half day um, uh, thing. But I, I would suggest that we could potentially on the afternoon of the third day, when all the people who have travelled internationally are travelling back, have a sort of Warwick think tank and just get together and brainstorm and introduce each other and, and, and go from there. Yeah, but I, I can send you email around about that later, near the time. Thanks, Ed. That would be a good idea. If you can forward those details of the conference either to Sumit or somebody, um, then uh, we can look into it. Um, any other question? Um, uh, Mo oh. Mozda? Mozda, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, about Orban, apart from um, considering uh, the wet shape uh, instead of like the slab. Uh, which was actually improvement um, compared with the slab. Um, he wasn't able to like consider the um, like the variation of stress inside the the uh, material. He only can model uh, for the surface of the material, not the inside the material. Ah, thank you very much, Jess. That's a very good point. Yes, and that that's common. Yeah, the questions were written. Yeah, the equation were written uh, based on theta, uh, which is the angle of uh, the, the the location of material respect to the like the vertical axis. So um, it only uh, could model for the surface. And I mean that's also a good point about slab theory as well. I mean, so slab slab theory is only able to do an average; it can't do the details on the inside. So yeah, exactly. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um... Any questions? No more? If no more further questions, uh, I would like to once again thank Ed um, for his time and wonderful uh, talk. Um, thank you all for joining. Yep, th uh, yes, thank you very much. And if, if anyone has any comments or suggestions yeah. or wants to come and tell me I'm wrong with anything, please do come and get in touch. I'd love to hear from you.